Hey everyone, in part four of this video series, I'm gonna show you how to install the transmission on a Honda S2000. The first thing you wanna do when installing the transmission is to lubricate things. Apply some high temp urea grease to the clutch fork teeth, the clutch fork hanger, and the release bearing guide. If you haven't done so already, lubricate the transmission input shaft as well. Now place the transmission on a floor jack or better yet, a transmission jack. If you place the jack right underneath the transmission drain plug, the transmission should be completely balanced. Use the jack to raise the transmission until it is aligned with the engine. As you are raising the transmission, make sure that the drive shaft doesn't get caught on the transmission output shaft. Before mating the transmission to the engine, it is critical that you insert the clutch fork into the transmission bell housing. You want to place the clutch fork so that the cup is facing towards the rear of the car, and you do not want the clutch fork engaged on the clutch fork hanger just yet. Once the clutch fork is in place, you will want to get the transmission input shaft through the clutch assembly. Ideally, you want the transmission input shaft to go right through the center of the clutch release bearing and through the center of the friction disc. If your car is on jack stands, this exercise can be particularly difficult, and I recommend laying underneath the transmission and wiggling it around and attempting to push it towards the engine with your feet bracing the bell housing. If done successfully, you should feel a pop or nudge similar to the one that you felt when removing the transmission. At this point, there should be less than an inch of gap between the transmission and the engine. In order to close the gap between the transmission and the engine, you can use the transmission mounting bolts themselves. There are a total of eight bolts that you will want to thread here. The easiest bolts to get started are the three longest bolts, which are inserted from the engine side. One is on the driver's side and two are on the passenger side. The three slightly shorter bolts are inserted from the transmission side as the upper transmission mounting bolts. Lastly, the two smaller bolts are inserted from the transmission side as the lower transmission mounting bolts. Once all the bolts are threaded, you can remove the floor jack supporting the transmission to create some more working room. What you want to do is carefully tighten each of the bolts a little bit at a time so that the transmission approaches the engine in a straight manner. If you feel resistance while tightening these bolts, you should stop and assess the situation because the resistance is likely caused by a dowel pin that is being crushed. The easiest way to install the three upper transmission mounting bolts is to use a 17 millimeter socket with a universal joint and a 30 to 36 inch extension drive bar. I will leave a link to the extension drive bar set that I use in the description below. The top two bolts should be relatively straightforward, but the bolt on the left side of the transmission bell housing is slightly different since it is wedged against a transmission tunnel. In order to clear the transmission tunnel, you will have to use a 3 8 inch socket and universal joint instead of a half inch socket. Don't forget to thread this bolt through the wiring harness mount as well. The two lowest transmission mount bolts can be tightened with a 14mm socket and a universal joint. The remaining three bolts are inserted from the engine side. The single bolt on the driver's side of the transmission can be tightened with a 17mm socket. The top and bottom bolt on the passenger side of the car can be accessed from underneath the car using a 17mm socket as well. Once the transmission has been successfully mated to the engine, you will want to torque down the bolts. Torque the bolts which require a 17 mm socket to 47 foot pounds, and the bolts which require a 14 mm socket to 33 foot pounds. Install the clutch fork on the clutch fork hanger so that the teeth of the fork are sitting around the clutch release bearing. Then install the clutch slave rubber boot. Afterwards, insert the rod of the clutch slave cylinder into the clutch slave rubber boot, compress the clutch slave cylinder, 
and use a 12 mm socket or wrench to install the two bolts securing the clutch slave cylinder to the transmission housing. Torque the two bolts to 16 foot pounds. Now before you do any additional work, you should take this opportunity to test out the clutch system to ensure that it is working properly so that you don't have to backtrack later. Use your foot to step on the clutch pedal and ensure it is not stuck or jammed in any way. If the pedal is stuck or jammed, you may have an issue with the clutch fork or the release bearing. With the engine and the transmission mated, you will want to connect the pickup sensor connector and reinstall the wiring harness onto the transmission. Once you have verified that the clutch system is working, use a floor jack or a transmission jack to raise the transmission until the rear mount touches the frame of the car. Use a 14 mm socket to install the three bolts securing the rear mount to the frame of the car. Torque the bolts to 28 foot-pounds. Since the transmission mount bolts are all finished, you can now raise the subframe. Place a floor jack underneath the subframe and support the subframe with a piece of wood. The piece of wood will have to run from the front of the subframe all the way to the engine mount stiffener to ensure that the subframe is supported evenly. I personally use a 2x6 that was 22 inches long. Raise the jack until the subframe meets the frame. The front subframe has six bolts that secure it to the frame, three on each side. If your car is an AP2, all six of these bolts will require a 19mm socket. If your car is an AP1, the bolts closest to the transmission will require a 17mm socket, while the other four bolts will require a 19mm socket. One thing to note here is that you should feel little to no resistance when reinstalling these bolts. If you do feel some resistance, you should remove the bolts, clean the threads, and reinstall it. The Ford Most Bolt in particular is well known for suffering from corrosion. Torque the two front bolts to 84 foot-pounds, and torque the rear bolt to 43 foot-pounds. Now that the steering rack is back in place, you can reinstall the steering rack couplers. If you followed my transmission removal video, you should have made a reference mark across the coupler and the torque sensor shaft. Rotate the steering rack until the coupler is aligned with the torque sensor shaft and slide the coupler onto the torque sensor shaft. Once aligned, use a 10 mm socket and an extension to tighten the upper coupler bolt and reinstall the lower coupler bolt. Torque the two bolts to 16 foot-pounds. Use a 10 mm socket with an extension to install the four bolts securing the transmission and shift boot to the frame of the car. Torque them to 7.6 foot-pounds. While you're down there, you will need to reinstall the drive shaft to the end of the transmission. The drive shaft is secured to the transmission output flange with six socket screws that require a 6 mm hex drive for AP1s and an 8 mm hex drive for AP2s. These bolts seem to be commonly stripped, but I have personally never stripped these bolts while using a proper hex drive and a universal joint. Reinstall two bolts at a time and rotate the drive shaft by hand in order to access the next two bolts. If you're having trouble rotating the drive shaft, ensure that the parking brake is removed and the transmission isn't in gear. For AP1s, torque the bolts to 24 foot-pounds, and for AP2s, torque the bolts to 36 foot-pounds. Reconnect the two oxygen sensors as well as the backup light switch connectors on the driver's side of the transmission. Then install the clips holding the two oxygen sensor wires to the passenger side of the transmission. You can let them dangle for now. In order to move the exhaust manifold into place, you will need some additional clearance. Use a floor jack to raise the passenger side of the motor upwards two inches in order to generate some clearance for the exhaust manifold. While the engine is raised, you should be able to insert the exhaust manifold into the engine bay from underneath the car like so. Once finished, lower the engine back down and remove the jack. Then use a 17mm deep socket to install the two nuts holding each motor mount to the subframe.
torque the nuts to 40 foot-pounds. The exhaust manifold is secured to the cylinder head with seven nuts. Five of the studs which the nuts are installed onto are clearly visible from above while the last two are hidden underneath and in between the exhaust manifold pipes. Use a 12mm deep socket to install the five nuts that are clearly visible from above. Then use a 12mm deep socket with an extension or a universal joint to install the two nuts which are hidden. Torque the nuts to 23 foot-pounds. Back underneath the car, you will have to install the exhaust manifold bracket. Use a 14mm socket to reinstall the two bolts securing the exhaust manifold bracket in place. Torque them to 33 foot-pounds. Use a 22mm wrench or an offset oxygen sensor socket to reinstall the upstream oxygen sensor onto the exhaust manifold. I recommend twisting the wiring harness counterclockwise before threading the oxygen sensor so that it doesn't want to unravel itself while you're tightening it. Torque the oxygen sensor to 16 foot-pounds. The last thing you need to do from underneath the car is install the catalytic converter. If you need help installing your catalytic converter, you can check out my catalytic converter replacement video, which will be linked down below. Now you will need to install the exhaust manifold cover. The exhaust manifold cover is secured with four bolts. Two are clearly visible from above, one is inserted through the side, and the last bolt is inserted underneath. Use a 12mm socket and an extension to install the two bolts visible from above. Then use a 12mm wrench to install the bolts inserted through the side and inserted underneath. Torque them to 16 foot-pounds. Next, you'll want to install the heat shield. The heat shield has four bolts that secure it to the frame. The first three bolts are relatively easy and the last bolt sits near the back of the valve cover. Slip the heat shield onto the last bolt and use a 10mm socket and ratchet to install the three bolts that are easy to reach. Then use a 10mm wrench to tighten the last bolt. Torque the bolts to 7.2 foot-pounds. The top starter bolt is one of the steps in this job that gives people a lot of difficulty. So much so that a lot of people simply choose not to reinstall the top starter bolt entirely. I will leave that judgment call up to you but for completeness, I will be reinstalling my top starter bolt. I recommend feeding the top starter bolt from the side of the intake manifold and getting it started by hand. In order to tighten the top starter bolt, I use at least a 16 inch extension with a universal joint and a 14 millimeter deep socket. Carefully insert the 14 millimeter deep socket where the alternator used to sit and feed it towards the starter. You can stick your right hand underneath the intake manifold and help guide the socket towards the top starter bolt. Once the 14mm deep socket is near the top starter bolt, you will want to ensure that the socket sits squarely on the bolt head so that you don't accidentally strip the bolt. Tighten the top starter bolt and torque it to 33 foot-pounds. With the top starter bolt in place or not, you can reinstall the alternator. If you need help installing your alternator, you can check out my alternator replacement video which will be linked down below. Next, you will need to reinstall the air intake. If you need help reinstalling your air intake, you can check out my air intake installation video which will be linked down below. Reinstall the shifter assembly. If you need help doing this, you can check out my shifter regrease video which documents the process in great detail. That video will be linked down below. Reinstall the two front wheels and lower the car back down to the ground. If you replace your clutch, you will have to break it in before you can start banging gears. For an OEM friction disc, the break-in procedure is quite simple. All you should need to do is perform 30 to 40 easy releases of the clutch. This can be easily achieved by driving around town and getting stuck in some stop and go traffic. During the break-in period, 
you may notice a new smell coming from the car after parking and this should be completely normal for the first few hundred miles. If you like this video, be sure to give it a thumbs up and smash that subscribe button if you'd like to see more. As always, feel free to leave a comment down below with a video you'd like to see in the future.